All right, guys, hope everyone's well and welcome back to the Improvement Podcast. So in this episode today, I'm going to touch on what not to focus on as a beginner. So in terms of why I'm creating this episode, there's a lot of information in the industry, some good, some not so good. And even the good information, people don't explain who that is directed towards, who that is valuable to, or who, who that information is going to be valuable for. So as a beginner, it's very easy to go on Instagram see people make posts and then implement that advice whereas that advice isn't applicable for you at that stage of your lifting career or your training career. Uh, so this episode is going to basically explain what matters when you're a beginner and what, or basically what doesn't matter and what you shouldn't focus on as a beginner uh, because I see people young in their training career or training, training practice or whatever Worrying about the wrong things, so I'm going to basically touch on what you shouldn't be worrying on. So in terms of the first thing I'm going to touch on, it's going to be stimulus to fatigue ratio. So stimulus, simply meaning how much you're getting from a set, how stimulating that set is on that target muscle. Uh, and as for fatigue, that's basically how tiring or how much fatigue that exercise produces. So some exercises will be more fatiguing than others for example when we are left let's say lifting more weight that's typical or loading our spine that's going to accumulate more fatigue than circumstances where we're using little weight and we're not loading our spine for example like a dumbbell lateral raise is not going to accumulate a lot of fatigue whereas a barbell back squat is or let's say a single arm bicep curl is going to accumulate very little fatigue whereas doing a deadlift variation will uh, and as a beginner, you don't really need to know and worry about how much fatigue you're accumulating. So fatigue is basically central nervous system fatigue. When we are in a fatigued state, we struggle to basically recover. We can't recruit as much muscle fibers uh, and train as close to failure when we're in a fatigued state. Some sim symptoms of having a lot of fatigue are things like feeling really tired, uh, low motivation to train, poorer performance etc and as a beginner I don't think you need to really worry about how stimulating a like a, a set is in comparison to how fatiguing it is you should just worry about how stimulating your sets are what I mean by this is when you're a beginner the overall weight you're going to be lifting is pretty low and your ability to train hard and train to failure is also going to be low so as a result you don't really need to worry about how fatiguing a movement is because it's not going to accumulate much fatigue so instead just focus on training hard with good form and you'll be completely fine in my opinion and instead of thinking about how stimulating our exercise is in comparison to how fatiguing it is or in other words it's stimulus to fatigue ratio just focus on stimulating yourself as effectively as possible focus on getting quality sets in and making sure you are training as hard as you can and what to worry about instead of stimulus to fatigue ratio is just simply making sure you're ticking your boxes outside the gym so you can recover because unless you're sleeping really poor drinking all the time and going out and you're really really stressed and you're doing a ridiculously active job unless you're doing all those things and you probably won't have to worry about deload you probably won't have to worry about how fatiguing an exercise is I've got clients that like sign up for me, sign up with me, sorry, that have, let's say, no training experience and they won't really run a deload their first year of training. And the reason being is they don't need it. Also, if, let's say, you're missing sessions here and there, then that's that's going to be serving you as a deload, if that makes sense. That's going to drop fatigue, so you don't really need to worry about that. If, let's say, you get more advanced, you get stronger and stronger, you've been training for a couple of years, you never miss sessions and you keep improving your training intensity that's maybe a scenario where you sh you could worry about how much fatigue you're accumulating and you could worry about things like deloading but as a beginner you don't really need to and following on to or before following on to that actually what we should worry about however is like soreness going into the next session so i'm talking about like central nervous system fatigue here I'm not talking about how sore your muscles are. If you have muscle soreness going into the next session, regardless if you're a beginner, intermediate or advanced, I don't really think that's that great a thing. What I mean by that is if you train legs twice a week, your quads are still really sore going into your next quad session, then I think that's a problem. If they just recover or now and then they are just a 
touch tender, I think that's okay. But I definitely make sure they're not super sore going into the next session. We don't have a what I'd class as a cross transfer of soreness into the next session because that can impair your performance, potentially increase your injury risk as well, in my opinion. So after that, the next thing I want to touch on is reps in reserve. This is something I really don't think beginners should even listen to at all or take into consideration because it is a training and approach that can work, yes. However, most beginners don't train hard enough to warrant using that approach. It's like I I believe I'm still I'm still improving my training intensity and I've had a background of doing sports since I was six, uh, and been in the gym for pretty much since I was sixteen and I'm now twenty two, which is quite scary to think about to be honest. Yeah, but I, I still believe I can improve my training intensity. So I don't think beginners should be leaving reps in reserve or following that style of training, to be honest, because you probably don't train hard enough to warrant that. And just like any skill, if you're wanting to get better at it, what do you do? You practice it. So how are you supposed to get better at training to failure and pushing yourself and having a high level of intensity in the gym if you don't practice it? Like time and time I see again, like, a client will say that's failure but like I, I know it's not the reps aren't slowing down and sometimes I've took clients to the gym and I've like pushed them on a leg press or like any other exercise and they've got much more in the tank than they actually think they do uh, so make sure you are maxing out your training intensity and making sure you're focusing on quality over quantity uh, I think that's something super important because if, let's say, you are, we know we need to get the effective reps close to failure to build muscle. So if we're leave, leaving, let's say, five reps in the tank, where let's say we're stopping five reps from failure, which is deemed the point where it starts to be quite stimulative. Because the closer we get to, f to failure, the more muscle we basically recruit. And we recruit the, basically, that fast twitch muscle fibers, the muscle fibers that are responsive to muscle growth when we're close to failure. And... If we are think if we think we're stopping five reps from failure, or let's say three, or even yeah, let's say three, and we're actually three reps away, or that our perception of failure is actually three reps away from what failure actually is, then you're training with six reps in reserve there, so you're not really getting much out of it from a muscle growth point of view. Whereas if you take it all the way to failure, you're going to be you're going to be stimulating muscle growth, even if you're perception of failure is not quite where it needs to be or you don't maybe train to complete failure you're still going to be in a better spot than if you leave a couple reps in the tank also personally i'm biased but i enjoy that approach of training i think it makes the most sense logically and that's the approach i use with myself and my clients it's fun that's uh when i think about like my best gym sessions the most like fun I've had in training, it's not like doing a set and leaving a couple of reps in the tank, it's taking all the way there at the end of the day. And following on from the central nervous system fatigue point or focusing on stimulus to fatigue ratio, I kind of covered this but like deloads are something you don't really need to do. Uh, so unless your recovery is very very poor, I don't really recommend deloading, you don't, you probably don't need to deload. I do recommend deloading if you need to, don't get me wrong there. but you most likely don't need to deload. You most likely don't accumulate enough fatigue. You most likely aren't ticking your boxes as well if you're a beginner, unless you just flip the switch from not going to the gym to absolutely nailing everything. But what I'd say is make sure you're nailing everything outside the gym. So let's say nutrition, you're nailing your sleep, you're nailing your stress management and making sure you're taking appropriate rest and your splits appropriate before worrying about like deloading, if that makes sense. Because... Most people aren't actually training too hard, they're just under-recovering. They aren't doing too much in the gym, they just aren't consistent and they aren't kind of adhering to what they need to outside the gym to allow them to recover. The next thing that I don't think beginners should really focus on is resistance profiles. So if you've not heard the term, uh, basically resistance profiles are basically like it's a profile of the movement in terms of where movement's hard and where movement's easy. Uh, for example, if you do a leg extension, it's hard at the top uh, where our quads are fully short, fully squeezed, you could say. At the bottom, it's a bit easier. So some people say 
they should structure the session placing the movements that are harder to get short at the, at the start and then movements that aren't as hard to fully like extend your leg like in a leg extension so basically it's saying that you should put like a leg extension first before like a squat variant or like a leg press and although this might have some benefit and value and some truth to it as a beginner i don't think this is something you need to worry about you don't need to worry about having the perfect setup in terms of structuring sessions where our movement's hard and where movement's easy because basically when we are trying to straighten our leg fully we like when we're shortening our quad or any other muscle as we get tired and fatigued we can't shorten it as effectively but we've got a lot of strength at the other parts of the reps which is why people say put it first and also for like a load management injury prevention point of view and i don't think those things are applicable for a beginner the first reason is because you probably don't need to worry about having like a perfect resistance from start to finish with a per perfect amount of tension on your muscle which is kind of like a more simple way to put it and a more understandable way, way to put it where like having good tension constant tension which is appropriate amount from start to finish you probably don't need to worry about that the reason being is to actually make resistance profiles matter you need to be performing movements with good execution good effort and as well as that making sure you are like uh, just being consistent over time so focus on those things first don't really worry about it because it probably doesn't matter for yourself also with the injury prevention point of view like if someone's squatting 200 kilos then it might be a good idea to do let's say a leg extension first to make them handle less weight on a on a squat but if you're squatting 60 kilograms and that doesn't quite apply to yourself again because you're not at the point where you need that you need to take that into consideration with your training if that makes sense and getting distracted by things like i've touched on so far and Things like resistance profiles just takes you away from what matters, takes you away from what's going to give you the most reward in your training, and that is training hard, training consistently, and having good form. Because, like, a resistance profile, why would that matter if your form's not good in the first place? So, and, the, like, I, I see it time and time again as well. It's like, people think they're... This isn't me trying to dig people's training efforts or slate people's training efforts. Uh, that's not my that's not my intentions at all like with this podcast i want to simply help people which is why i'm kind of pointing this out but some people quote unquote struggle with like movements like the doctor machine and they'll make it really really slow the doctor machine's basically the one where you're driving your knees in close and closing your legs for those that don't know they'll make it really really slow on the first half when they're starting to close their legs and then when they're about close they'll fly in and touch the pads together which is the opposite of where the machine's hard and the machine's easy. Which basically tells me that's not failure. They're not even reached failure. Uh, they're just kind of uncomfortable, so they're giving up. It's kind of like a deer in the headlights type thing. Uh, in the nicest way possible. So as a result, like that's not going to... Their, their resistance profile doesn't matter because they're not training to the point where they need to even take that into consideration. And... Next up, the last point I'm going to make is you shouldn't really worry about connecting with a body part, if that makes sense. So what I mean by that is getting like a strong contraction or feeling a body part an awful lot because someone, as someone said, called David Tate or Dave Tate, he said you can flex bone. What I mean by that is you can't contract bone. When you've not got a lot of muscle, you're not going to feel a great contraction. You need muscle there to get a good contraction, if that makes sense. So the more muscle you build, the more you'll probably be able to contract and feel different muscle groups around your body. So if you're starting out, you don't have a ton of muscle, don't worry if you can't, let's say, contract a certain muscle group too well. What I'd say is, as a beginner, make sure you're, again, training hard, training consistently, making sure your form on paper is good, meaning you're controlling it, you're using a full range of motion, and then over time you can kind of dial down on trying to maybe connect with a body part or feel a body part a bit more. Uh, which will be dictated by your execution and also just having muscle in that area. And also, like many things impact sensation. So sensation doesn't mean you're targeting a muscle very well. For example, if you get to the top of, let's say, a squat and you squeeze your quads really hard, you'll probably feel it. You'll feel your quads contract. But there's no load on your quads in that portion of the lift, so there's not really much value in squeezing your quads there. The same applies with, like, a... Uh, like a barbell bench press if you're squeezing your triceps at the top of a barbell bench press you're not really loading them much so you're not going to get much out of it and same with like you see folk do like a uh, folk like hold a plate in between their hands and move their hands backwards and forwards but they're actually travel 
sorry, they're actually challenging their their shoulders, their delts, just holding their arms out in front of them. They're not actually challenging their chest a lot because of the way gravity works. The plate wants to go down and they're like holding the plate with their palms, bringing it close to their body and far away while standing. If you lie down and done it, it would work your chest slightly more, but still not a great exercise. So don't really worry about sensation or feeling it a lot. See if your form's good and you are training hard, then you're going to be targeting a muscle. For example, if you can't, let's say, feel your quads a lot during a squat, but you're getting as much bend in the knees you can, let's say you're like going right down, so your bum's almost touching the ground in a squat, your knees are going over your toe, you're staying relatively upright, you're going to be challenging your quads a lot because because like the role of your quad is to extend your leg or the muscle in your thigh is to basically extend your leg. So if you're going from your leg really bent to straight, then something's going to be moving it there and that's going to be your quad, which is its role, if that makes sense. But, uh, but yeah, hope you've enjoyed the episode, you found it valuable. Uh, if you've got any questions or any episodes you'd like to see, then please just feel free to drop me a message. And if you don't and you listen to the podcast, feel free to follow me on Instagram. My Instagram is just Charlie J Cuthbert. No underscores, no spaces. And yeah, thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it as always. If uh, if you don't mind, give it a like, share, uh, subscribe and drop a comment if you're watching it or listening to it on YouTube. So yeah, thank you very much everyone for watching and hope everyone has a great rest of their day.